Today is also a day of prayer as designated by the North American Division. And so before I speak the word to you, I ask, would you join me for a moment of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you again for allowing us to see the beginning of a new year. As we reflect on last year, there have been so many challenges. And as we begin this new year, God, we commit our lives to you because we start this new walk with the realization that without your presence with us, we will be walking in darkness. I ask, oh God, that you will come into our lives first, come into our homes. God, come into our church. We want you to be our guide this year every day so we seek God your special favor I ask God that you will remember those of our family friends or fellow church members who may not be here today because they are wandering away Oh, Father, we pray that we will always keep before us the realization that your coming is near. That you are even at the door. And so, God, help us to live lives that give a testimony to the eminence of your coming. Now, Father, I ask your special favor upon our church. Across this, the North American division. I ask your special favor upon our leaders, the ones you have chosen to provide direction and leadership. You've told us in your word that if the blind leads the blind, we will all fall into the ditch. So I ask your special favor on our leaders so that they would be endowed with a special measure of your spirit. It will help them to lead us aright. I pray for our own church here. God, we just pray that this year we'd be better people than we were last year. May your spirit help us along that way. And now I ask that your spirit will come and be our teacher as we open your word and May something be said today that would encourage every single person. Thank you in advance of the blessing. For we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I read this week a story of a little bird, a parakeet, called Chippy. Chippy was in his cage and he enjoyed his cage, Chippy was very full of life. Chippy loved to sing. And the story says that Chippy's owner came in one day and decided to clean his cage by using his vacuum cleaner. 
So he pushed the hose into the cage and began to suck up all of the trash. And uh, before you know it, lo and behold, Chippy was sucked up. Chippy's owner pulled the plug and grabbed onto his vacuum cleaner and opened up the bag and sure enough, he was so relieved. Chippy was alive. But Chippy was all messed up. Dirt all over. Stuff was all over into his feathers and so uh, uh, he, he, he ran over to the sink and he, he opened up the tap and, uh, and he began to wash him over. While he's washing Chippy out and he discovers that Chippy begins to shiver. Now he's cold. Something's not right. So the story says he rushes over and gets a little blow dryer <laughs> and begins to blow him dry. <laughs> begins to begins to blow him up, well, well, the heat was a little too much for Chippy. <laughs> he puts Chippy back into the cage, and as the story concludes, a reporter met this owner and asked, well, how is Chippy doing? He says, well, he seems fine, but he's, he's just staring at you now. He's not singing anymore. <laughs> and I thought that that story may describe some of our experiences, maybe in the last year. We've been through some stuff, and, uh, and uh, you may have come in this morning still feeling like Chippy. Sucked up. Washed out. And blown over. And all I can do for you today is to pray that your 2016 turns out to be a much better year than 2015 was. You know, you and I do have the potential to be successful. We can live life successfully. You know, wouldn't it be nice if we can just live through life without any problems? That would be beautiful, wouldn't it be? No problems. Even when, uh, even when the, the bills are high and the funds are low, you can walk through with a smile on your face. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if you can just be happy, happy, happy all the time? I want to believe that, that maybe, just maybe that is possible. There is a secret and uh, the Bible discusses as we read through the scripture reading this morning, I want to go back to that passage of scripture because there is a dimension in that passage we used this morning in John chapter 11 where Jesus presents what we now know as the Lord's Prayer. John 11 presents a dimension that is not found 
in uh, the other rendering of the, of the prayer, if you look at Matthew chapter 6, for example, where Jesus introduces that prayer, and you compare Matthew 6 with John 11, you will discover that uh, there is a piece added on to the prayer down there in John 11 that is not in Matthew 6. That is not in Luke 11. Matthew 6, Luke 11. I'm going to submit to you today, my brothers and my sisters, that we need to spend time in prayer, I should say, more time. I'm going to assume that we do pray. So let me say, more time in prayer. And, uh, and prayer of a specific nature. I am submitting to you today that we need to pray more for the indwelling, the infilling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives will make the difference. The presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives will make a difference. God wants us to be like him. God wants us to be like him. And the agency of the Holy Spirit has been given to aid us in this whole process of character transformation. You and I can be real cool. Not just with each other. But God can look at us and be really happy. Only though if we allow the Holy Spirit to transform our lives in what he wants us to be. And so I would love to propose that uh, we all, we all, at the beginning of this year, we all declare that we want to allow the Holy Spirit to make us better people. You see, the Christian life ought to be a life of growth and development. You should not be found the same place in 2016 that you were in 2015. I'm going to say you should not be found at the same place you were in 2015 in 2016. You and I should grow. So let me look at the text. Let me look at the text. Luke 11 came to pass. And as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of the disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John taught his disciples. And he said unto them, when ye pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it, in, is, it, as is it in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive each other that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, Matthew 6 ends the story right at this point. But look at what Luke adds. Luke adds a story, a parable. 
beginning of verse 5, he says, And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. Lend me three loaves. Verse 6. For a friend of mine is in his journey. He's come to me. And I have nothing to set before him. Lend me because a friend of mine needs something. All right? Note that. And he from within shall answer and say, I'm at verse 7, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto thee, Though you will not rise and give me, because he is, he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, that's an important word I will talk about in a minute, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, ask. Take note of that little word, ask. And it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And he to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father. Will you give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish. Will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Verse 13. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit? Now he tacks on at the end the fact of the Holy Spirit. Why? That's important and interesting. How much more shall your Heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit if you ask? If you ask? If you ask, He will give you the Holy Spirit. If you ask, He will give you the Holy Spirit. What we need is the Holy Spirit. What we don't have is, is the Holy Spirit. What we need is the Holy Spirit. How much more shall your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit if you ask? If you ask. So what is lacking in our lives is that power. That power that we need. And uh, we don't have access to the power because we don't ask. The secret lies in the art of prayer. The secret to your success lies in the art of prayer. We don't have it because we don't ask for it. Either we don't pray consistently or we pray amiss. One can be in church, and I dare say every Sabbath, and not pray aright. Your prayer life needs to be what it ought to be. In order to experience your fullest potential. So as we look at the scripture this morning. And we look at verse 1 of the scripture. We see the disciples realizing that they have a need. And they came to Jesus and they asked. Jesus. Would you teach us how to do it? We recognize that that. There's a problem. There's a little lack. We want to we wanna be right, but we don't know how to do it. 
Would you teach us how to do it? Even though we are in church, we have the same need. And uh, it is our privilege to make the same request. Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. So as you study the prayer that Jesus gave you, notice that there are four general areas in the model Jesus presents to the disciples. There, there are just four general areas that I, I think we've been come accustomed to. When we pray, we come to God and uh, we, can, we can thank him for things that he has done. We, we come to God with our tribute of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, number one. Number two, we can ask God to supply our wants. Number two, now God has already promised that he will supply all those things that we need. But through a prayer, we can ask God to give us some of the other stuff. Our wants. Then we have the privilege of confessing our sins. And that's a beautiful privilege we have. We can go to God independently, individually. Talk to him personally. We don't have to pay anybody to do that for us. Nobody can you know, dangle this thing over our heads. If you don't, that's a beautiful privilege. Amen. Prayer is a wonderful thing that you and I can just simply talk to God and to think that we can talk to him about anything, even those things that we are afraid to talk to other people about. We can just feel free to talk to God. Confess our sins. And then the fourth thing, claim his promises. Those promises that he has already made. And the Bible is replete with these promises. You know, uh, if I promise you that I will give you $20 if you show up to church next Sabbath. You can uh, show up to church, and uh, then when you see me, you can claim your 20 If I promise, I have to deliver. <laughs> I'm not promising. He's ready for his 20. But God has already provided in his word a mirage of, of promises. We can claim those and we can challenge God on his word. When God says, listen, if you're faithful to me, if you're only faithful to me, uh, 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 your, your, your table will never go without bread. When God says that, you can take that to the bank. Have you ever been there? You can take him at his word. We can claim those promises. So when you look at the model prayer, uh, we find those elements in there. And as we study additionally what Luke had to say, uh, we discover that Jesus wants us to ask for some other things. So as we begin to dig a little deeper, beginning at verse 5 of Luke 11, we see some steps there that help us to get to where we ought to be and the vehicle the vehicle is asking, asking, asking. 
There are many things that we can ask for. But as we look at the parable, here are four things that Luke describes. Luke says, first, we should ask not for ourselves. Ask not for ourselves. First thing we see there, Luke going over to his neighbor. The man, Luke. In the parable going with the man it's going over to his neighbor and he's giving him a story well I have this friend of mine who has checked in could you give me some bread not for me not for me but for him but for him ask to give. So in this parable, we, we notice that, that Jesus here represents the petitioner as asking that he may give, asking for a friend, not for himself. So let me ask you, when was the last time you prayed asking God to give you something so that you can give it to someone else? See, most times we pray just for ourselves. That is what we call, what's the word over there? Selfishness, right? Now, God is just the opposite. God is a given God. So given that he gave his son even though we didn't deserve it. And God wants us to be like him. So instead of asking for ourselves, we should ask to give to others. Now, if you end the prayer where Matthew ends it, and, uh, and you miss some of these elements, wow! Are you saying, Pastor, that, that, that when we pray, when you get into real prayer, real prayer is asking God to endow you with enough and all that you need to be able to supply, not solely to you, but to someone else. That is in need. We have to get to the place where we are not simply about ourselves. Ask to give. And then we see this word in the, in the text, this word importunity. Importunity. What does that word mean? That word means to beg. To beg. That word means to be persistent. To beg. Why does God want us to really be persistent in our prayers? Why does he want us to stay with it? Why does he want us to pray and pray again and keep praying? Because you've been there. I know you've prayed and nothing has happened. And then you stop praying. And then you begin to question God about things and you get discouraged. God wants us to be persistent. And that word importunity conveys the idea of literally begging God. So much of what you want 
did not happen in 2015 because you quit praying too early. You gave up too early. God wants us to be persistent. When that man went over to his neighbor, uh, he, he, the, the text says he was, he was persistent. He would not leave without getting that bread. The main reason for importunity is because of sin in the life. In case you've forgotten, you and I are very sinful creatures. We are full of sin. And it is because of that sin in the life, that sin hinders. It hinders what God wants to do for us. And through us, that sin hinders. So, uh, here's an illustration. Uh, my car isn't starting. The battery is dead. So I got some jumper cable and, and uh, you know that little thing there and you hook it up to a, a battery that is alive on one end and then on, on my end, the dead end, I hook up those cables over there and I get in and I expect that when I turn the key my car is going to start. And then I get into the car and nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. It's not coming through. So, uh, so we go back out and we begin to examine things. Uh, check the cable on the live end. Everything looks fine over there. You check the cable. Is it broken? Everything looks fine. The cable is just perfectly fine. And you get into my dead car and you begin to look around. <gasps> There's a problem. My battery is all corroded. The poles are all corroded. There's a whole lot of stuff and buildup on the battery pole. And so uh, the current from the live battery is, is making its way over. And when it gets to the pole of my battery, it cannot penetrate because my battery is corroded. So, our lives are full of corrosion. That corrosion we call sin. Therefore, God's power can't get through. God's power can't get through. We have to get the corrosion of sin out of our lives so that God's power can get through. And so what I'm saying to you this morning is that one of the reasons the Lord didn't answer your prayer in 2015 was because there was corrosion on your poles. Sin in the life. And God's power couldn't get through. God wants us to clean that out. And one of the reasons why God just simply cannot answer the prayer at the point and at that time is because he has to work with us. He has to work us through to get rid of the corrosion. Once the corrosion is removed, then the power flows. Things happen. Things happen. So God has to develop our faith. That's another reason God delays answers to our prayer. And so we must be persistent. 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 Don't give up too early. You have to stay with it. Even, I remember the story of Elijah. When Elijah prayed for rain, there was not even a hint of rain around. Elijah kept on praying. Kept on praying. Yes? And, and isn't it how 
God works. You know, that this song was done just to help prepare us to listen to this word. So having asked according to his word, we should believe his promise, press our petitions with a determination that will not be denied. God does not say, ask once and you shall receive. It's not in the book. He bids us to ask. And what we see from studying other passages, he, he bids us to ask unwaveringly, persistently. The persistent asking brings the petitioner into a more earnest attitude and gives him an increased desire to receive the things for which he is asking. We give up too early. Then, our faith, our trust, our faith in God. You know, as I was preparing this message, I noted that, uh, you know, as Christians, we exercise sometimes more faith in ourselves. Yes, we devise our plans and we strategize and all of that stuff. And uh, we think that that is it. We exercise more faith in ourselves than we do in God, who is the only one that is able to provide. We think we have faith, but it is only the impulse of the moment. Our prayers are to be earnest and persistent. God is going to do what he will do. The more earnestly and steadfastly we ask, the closer will be our spiritual union with Christ. That's Christ's Objects Lessons, page 145. So a part of the reason why God doesn't answer immediately and why we have to continue in petition is to develop our faith in him. Develop our faith in him. Then, as I move quickly, the text also says we should ask for bread. That's specifically what the man asked for. He said, I have a friend. Could you give me some bread? Give me some bread. Ask specifically for bread. And not only physical bread, but spiritual bread. And I want to highlight the spiritual part of this message here because uh, Jesus Christ is the bread of life. There are lots of people who are hungering for the bread of life. And uh, we ought to pray that God will give us bread so that we can give to those who are hungry. I'll tell you this uh, very quietly. When was the last time we asked for spiritual bread to give to a dying world? I think we as a church, we are not thinking enough about those who are dying around us lost. You see, we come into church and we pride ourselves in the fact that we are a church and we are trying to serve God and we are doing the best of ourselves. But understand in the context of my message this morning, we are talking about others. We are too busy thinking about ourselves. When Christ was on the earth, his entire mission was to save souls. The Bible says, Son of Man cometh to seek and to save the lost. That was his burden. That should be our burden. I submit to you today that we do not have a burden for souls. If we really did, this building will be too small. Now, I do understand everyone can't preach, everyone can't teach, but everyone can do something to reach his soul. 
God has given everyone at least one talent or gift to touch someone. But instead of using it, we bury it and we make excuses as to why we can't witness for the Lord. God will give us what we need. We must ask for bread. Pray that God will empower us to help those who are in need. And as we embark upon this new year, one of the things I'm praying for is that, that this new year, we as a church family will really spend a little more time looking out for the, those who are on the outside, outside of the circle. You are already in. You know, the lifeguards aren't going to go out there to help you get the boat, your boat in. Lifeguards are going to go out to try to help that person who is going down, going down. And I want to submit to you that the business of the church ought to be not so much for the entertainment of those of us who are already in. That is something I want us to focus on on this new year. So we need to plead for the Holy Spirit. We need to plead for the Holy Spirit. And God will empower us to do his work. Of course, as you look at the latter part of the, the text, that's exactly what we are asked to pray for. We are asked to pray for the Holy Spirit. Verses 11 through 13 talks about the Heavenly Father being willing to give us the thing we ask for, but he is willing to give us especially the Holy Spirit. That's what he is most willing to give. And the reason why he is asking us to pray for the Holy Spirit in these times is because he wants us to be like him. He wants us to be giving people. Now, there's a difference between receiving the Holy Spirit at baptism and being filled with the Holy Spirit. There has to be an experience beyond the new birth. That's the first experience of the Holy Spirit. You come to Christ... You're a sinner. The Holy Spirit speaks to you. You understand where you are. You give your heart to him. That's the first experience with the Holy Spirit. The second experience with the Holy Spirit that each of us should have is what the Bible describes as a baptism of the Holy Spirit. In some places you will see references made to the early rain. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is a special endowment of the Holy Spirit that is given so that we can be transformed. The early rain. That has been available to all Christians since Pentecost. And that is the special infilling of the Spirit into the life of the believer which brings Christ more uh, fully into his life uh, so that Christ can live out his life within us. That is what the Apostle Paul refers to in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 when he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. That's a special endowment of the Holy Spirit to help us to live right and to be right and to do right and to say things that are right. The Holy Spirit does that. That's the second experience that you and I must, must have. We must have that first experience, of course, the new birth experience. But we must also have that second experience, the experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, now we all can be at church. We can be in the building. But I want you to know that we can be missing out on some of that experience.
That's why, you know, uh, sometimes a lot of strange things happen at church. Because there are people in the building who have not been baptized by the Holy Spirit. And the ironic thing about that is that uh, the Bible has already told us that these people, there'll be such people in the building until Jesus comes. So if somebody knocks you over at church, understand that church is not that kind of perfect place. Because some of us haven't been baptized. But that's an experience I want each of us to have. That experience of asking, when you wake up in the morning and you turn and you discover that you're alive and you, you well, oh, God has blessed you with another day and you're anxious to go out to do all your things and to make all your money and to get involved in all your, your stuff and what have you, you have to take the time and you have to be deliberate and purposeful about it. You have to turn your life over to the Holy Spirit. You have to say, whether it is, it, is, it is in word or thought, you have to say, dear God, I give my life to you again today. Would you come into my mind? in the person of your Holy Spirit. God, I'm giving him permission to make up my mind for me. Yes. And then when God gives you the good sense to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, you, you have to know, hey, this is his voice. And if the Holy Spirit says go this way and, and everybody and everything else is saying going that way, but the Spirit says go this way, and you're thinking, well, I, I, I'm supposed, I want to go that way, but the Spirit says this way. I'm telling you, you can be successful if only you develop the ability to discern, discern His voice. And then you have the good sense to just simply follow. Because sometimes, I'm telling you this, sometimes uh, what the Holy Spirit says to you may not make sense in the now. But give it a little time, you'll figure it out. Oh man, I made a boo-boo back there. I should have. Yes. So we need that experience, that second experience. Uh, with the Holy Spirit. It is a baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit coming into the life and taking charge of things. Right? And he will not come if we don't let him. So we have to let him in. We have to let him in. Hence the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this whole subject of righteousness by faith very closely aligned with this subject. But then there is a third experience. There is a third experience. The third experience of the Holy Spirit, uh, often referred to as the latter rain, puts the finishing touches on our character. And then it gives us power to proclaim the message of the last days. That third experience with the Holy Spirit is what will also give us strength to pass through the time of trouble. And I'm submitting to you today that we need all three experiences. Not just the first. We need the second. We absolutely need the third. So as we review the second instruction of prayer that uh, Jesus gave, we see this added dimension there in Luke 11, we see that, uh, of course, we have to ask to give. We see we need to ask with importunity. We need to ask for bread. 
we need to ask for the Holy Spirit because we can't exist without him. It is this last asking where many of us fall. While we may ask for other things, the main thing we should be asking for in this time is a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the piece of the, that is missing. This is the piece that is missing with, with many of those who pray. We don't pray enough for a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we may have received a little bit of the Spirit at our baptism. We needed that second experience, the early rain. But without this final outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we are not prepared to face the events of the last days. We need to pray for a special experience with the Holy Spirit. Now listen to what Ellen White says in the book Testimonies to Ministers, page 502. She says this. She says, The Holy Spirit may be falling on hearts all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. That is serious. So, I've spent half an hour talking to you about stuff. But on that note, I want you to take this very seriously. So let's assume you're going to forget most of what I've, I've just said. Forget it. I don't mind. You can forget it. But remember this piece. It may be falling on hearts all around. But we shall not discern or receive it. The Spirit is falling down in copious measure into this building right now. And uh, then there's somebody in here who doesn't even recognize it. Is not receiving it. God May that one person not be me. Because a lot of rain will bring revival individually and collectively as a church and grow us where Christ is seen 100% of the in our lives. We have to get to that place where when we walk around, Jesus Christ is, is, is seen in us. People can just simply look at us and say, hmm, this, they look like a different guy. Looks like a, oh, that looks like a nice guy. And you know, sometimes I think I have the ability to do that. I look at, I can, I look at some people's faces. Have you ever figured that out? You can just look at a face and you, 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 and you want to walk on the other side because something on that face says, don't come near me. <laughs> Sour face. But when we are filled with the Holy Spirit and people see us, they'll look at us, oh, well, this looks like a nice guy over there. Oh, look like a nice guy. And people will walk over to you and say things to you and, and you wonder, why are they telling me all their business? Because they see something in you that they can trust. They're beginning to share and open up. Yes, is it because of the, the Holy Spirit in us? I know the hour is late. I'm going to close. The book Evangelism, page 701, the servant of the Lord says that the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the church is looked forward to as in the future. But it is the privilege of the church to have it, and the next word is, now. Seek for it, pray for it, believe for it. We must have it. And heaven is waiting to bestow it.
Beautiful promise. So if you want it, you can have it. You can have it. Robbie, go to the instrument. The song, I, it's over Omi, Holy Spirit. 260 is the song. 260. We'll sing a little bit of it, and then I'll go to the table. And I want you to sing if you want it. Sing it if you want it. You want to, you want, you want to experience that special outpouring this year, 2016. I would like this year to be a spirit-filled year. Spirit-filled. Above all else. God, give me this. Give me that. Give me the other. But God, please, give me a portion. A special portion of the Holy Spirit. Oh, how much we will be transformed. Other lives will be transformed. The church will be transformed. What a beautiful experience it would be. Fill me with thy hallowed spirit. Come, O oh come. And fill me now. I wanted to sing that third verse because I know you're weak. I know we need help. Let's sing it. I am weakness, full of weakness. I am weak. 